Okay, so with your permission, uh, I'll start with the introduction and we can carry on with the talk. Please. Yes. So good morning to one and all present here. I would like to welcome all of you to the second session of the Entanglement Public Lecture Series. I will st I'll start with the introduction of Dr. Sri Hari Sridharan. Uh, with a PhD from the uh, from the University of Manchester, UK, Dr. Sri Hari Sridharan has been an Associate Professor of School of Mathematics, Ayurveda since 2014. Dr. Sri Hari Sridharan has also worked as Senior Lecturer at IIT Guwahati and as Assistant Professor at Chennai Mathematical Institute. Dr. Sri Hari's uh, Dr. Sri Sridharan's research interest focus focuses mainly on the Riemann sphere's complex but beautiful polymorphic non-invertible dynamic systems. He has also contributed towards various aspects in the final analysis of Julia sets of maps and has been a great enthusiast of the ergodic theory. Today we have Dr. Sri Hari Sridharan on the panel on talk on the on the panel to talk on geometry, Tao Artemis. I'm sure you all are excited to hear his take on the same. Uh, so we may please start with the talk. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks very much for the uh, introduction. And I sincerely hope that my lecture is as interesting as uh, the introduction was made out to be. Uh, I hope I am sufficiently audible and my slide is sufficiently visible. Uh, Sharan, yes. if you can tell me about that, I'll start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your slides are visible and you're audible. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. When I was contacted to deliver a lecture to a school students, I took about a day or two to decide what I should lecture on. And I mean, there are various areas in mathematics, that is, there are various areas that as school students you are introduced to. And my aim was to reinforce certain things in what you have learned. And I zeroed in on geometry for several reasons, one of which is a picture is worth a thousand words. And what better field can I talk about than geometry when I want to insist that pictures are, you know, the backbone of several things that we do in mathematics. You take set theory, you take uh, coordinate geometry, you take uh, even things in algebra, uh, there are easy, you know, uh, proofs available for several modern theorems using pictures. There is, in fact, an area called diagram algebras that is kind of, you know, uh, growing up. Uh, it's in its nascent stage and, you know, it's it, people are working in it for the past, I don't know, 20, 25 years. You may wonder why do I call it a nascent stage when it has been uh, when people have been working on it for 20, 25 years. But uh, believe me, a theoretical discipline, uh, you know, kind of grows extremely slowly. However, it grows extremely solidly as well. And so, uh, the foundations are being laid, is what I would say. So towards that end, I decided to talk on geometry. And the mysterious things that, you know, we kind of find in geometry, the mysterious mistakes that we make in geometry without even knowing that they are mistakes, rather, you know, that is exactly what my uh, topic is going to be. As you may know, geometry began from the times of Euclid. I'm not telling you that geometry did not exist prior to that time. What I'm rather telling you is that Euclid was the first person to actually sit down and write down the axioms on which your geometry is based on and then derive theorems and proofs based on those axioms. And we also have tradition in India, uh, the Kerala School of Mathematics, uh, which started with Madhava of uh, Sangamagrama. 
this was somewhere close to uh, Kori Kodu of these days, Calicut. Uh, there was a school of mathematics over there as well that have produced immensely interesting results, not necessarily only in geometry, but in several aspects of it. There are several Indian scriptures where your what we attribute to Pythagoras, uh, Pythagorean triads, uh, uh, integers satisfying a squared plus b squared equal to c squared, uh, they have been found in several Indian scriptures of the year as well, much before uh, Pythagoras' times. But having said all those things, let's kind of come to what we want to discuss today. I'm going to discuss three different pictures in today's lecture, extremely elementary pictures. One will be circles, the second triangles, and the third squares. So let's start with the first of these things, circles. At any point of time when I'm uh, discussing, if there are questions or something, uh, I mean, I may not be able to uh, see your face or see your reactions to whatever you're doing. But then if you would write something on the dialog box, I'm pretty sure the chair, uh, uh, you know, the Science and Technology Council uh, person, uh, Sharan, will uh, alert me about it and we can kind of stop it and we can discuss what uh, what, what is necessary. So let's start with circles. So I'm going to make a tiny construction and, uh, you know, kind of, see what is, you know, what, what we come about. So I'll take a circle. Let this be a circle with center O and radius R. The radius is strictly positive. Of course, you know, you have a circle and therefore the radius is bigger than zero. Now I want to take a point P inside the circle. If I take a point P inside the circle, then I know that the distance OP should be strictly smaller than R, R being the radius of the circle. What I then do is I produce this line OP to Q such that my OP times OQ is R squared. My radius is R because I have taken P inside the circle, naturally my point Q goes outside the circle and I choose this point Q in this fashion that my OP times OQ is R squared. Then I construct the perpendicular bisector of this line segment PQ. Let the perpendicular bisector of PQ meet the circle at U and V and meet the line PQ at R. And finally, I want to join the points OU and PU. I want to draw the line segments OU and PU. This is my picture. Is everyone happy with the picture? We have a circle with center O and radius R. We have a point P such that OP is smaller than R. I take a point Q in such a fashion that my OP times OQ is R squared. I construct the perpendicular bisector of PQ meeting the circle at UV and the line PQ at R. I join OU and PU. I will not alter the picture. I will keep the picture as it is. I'll only erase the other bits of whatever I have written down over here and then I'll show you something. So let's start with this. We started with the, uh, I mean, the construction gave us R squared to be equal to OP times OQ. Now I can write my OP as OR minus RP. And I can write my line segment OQ as OR plus RQ. So I write my OP as OR minus RP, OQ as OR plus RQ. 
but then I know that R is the midpoint of the line segment PQ, and therefore RQ is the same as RP, and therefore I will replace my RQ with RP. I have OR minus RP times OR plus RP. Now I, I mean this is a basic uh, algebraic identity: A minus B times A plus B, which is equal to a squared minus b squared. So I write this as O R squared minus R P squared. Now consider this triangle O U R. The triangle O U R is right angled at R. O U is the hypotenuse, and consider the triangle. P U R, that is also a right angle triangle, a uh, right angled triangle, tri right angled at R, and P U is the hypotenuse, and therefore I can write my O R squared as O U squared minus U R squared. Similarly, I can write my R P squared as P U squared minus U R squared. Now what I do is, I expand the bracket. I have a minus sign outside, and therefore this gives me O U squared minus U R squared minus P U squared plus U R squared. I have a plus U R squared minus U R squared. I cancel those things out. I have O U squared minus P U squared. But you know what? O U is nothing but the radius of the circle. U lies on the boundary of the circle. That's how we chose, right? So, O U is nothing but the radius little r itself. So, this can be written as r squared minus p u squared. Now, what have we obtained? The left hand side has the r squared. The right hand side has the r squared minus p u squared. I can cancel out the r squared on both ends, on both sides of the equation, and I have p u squared to be equal to zero. If my p u squared is zero, it means the same as my p u being equal to zero. What does it mean for p u to be equal to zero? P is a point that we chose from inside of the circle. Because we said O P is strictly less than R, and U is a point by construction that lies on the circumference of the circle. P U equal to zero actually means the distance between the point P and U should be equal to zero. But that can't be true because by construction. Your P is inside the circle, and U lies on the circumference of the circle. Is there a problem, or are we fine, sir? I think there is a raised hand uh, among the participants. Uh, yes, Kushi. Yes, Kushi please. Kumari. Yes. Yes, if you please. have a question, uh, you can please ask Dr. Sherry. If you have a question, or do you, if you if you if you see that there is some problem in whatever we have done, you are welcome to kind of stop me and correct me there. So I think we can continue if uh, no one is answering. Okay. Do you at least see that there is a problem? Are you able to at least see that P is a point inside the circle 
and by construction u is a point on the circumference of the circle how did these two points coincide how did these two points merge together at the end of the day how did the distance between p and u become zero does that question at least reckon is there a yes or a no that's being typed no sir currently there's nothing on the chat box for a while A math lecture becomes extremely difficult when we don't participate. In fact, the exact reason why even teachers in school kind of, even when they write on boards, turn around and look at your faces is because they want to make sure that you understand as they go along. I have been uh you know rendered in a situation where i cannot see your faces and therefore i'm kind of presenting out of here but i really prefer if we could have more participation i understand that all of you unmuting yourselves and all of you kind of shouting at the same time uh, will create chaos at the same time if you can raise your hand and if sharan can direct somebody to speak then the lecture becomes all the more interesting for all of us so can i request you to do that yes, yes. we have a raised hand but ankita said yes ankita please please mohan has unmuted and so maybe has something to say no no sir it becomes easy for me to kind of point at people and name you people and ask you to give me a reply but then that would kind of uh, become very i mean i i i think that it would be unnecessary so i really hope that you people will open your mouth and you know tell me something or if you do not understand at least tell me that so that you know we can i mean it shouldn't be an exercise for me to kind of uh, yap 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 for the next uh, one hour right it should be more participative between both of us
Okay. I did what I could. <clears throat> uh, sir? Yes, please. Is the screen yeah, uh, visible again? Yes, sir. Yes, screen is visible again. Uh, if you could, hmm. if you could, if you could just state the problem, uh, the statement of the problem again, I think uh, that would be absolutely fine. Maybe I'll just see. I need to now kind of. Hmm, I'll go here first. So this is what we had uh, by construction. You have a circle with center O and radius. R bigger than zero. I take a point P inside the circle in such a fashion that my OP is smaller than R, strictly smaller than R. I have my point Q in such a fashion that my OP times OQ is R square. So because my point P is inside the circle, Q naturally lies outside the circle. My OP times OQ is R square. I construct the perpendicular bisector UV of the line segment PQ, which meets PQ itself at R. I join the line segments OU and PU. This is what I have. Once I have this, I am interested in telling you that we started with R squared equal to OP times OQ. My OP can be written as OR minus RP. OQ can be written as OR plus RQ. But RQ is the same as RP because R is the midpoint of the line segment PQ. So I write this as OR minus RP times OR plus RP, which is nothing but OR squared minus RP squared. I make use of the Pythagoras theorem. I know I have a right angle at R in triangles OUR and PUR. So making use of the Pythagoras theorem, I write OR squared as OU squared minus UR squared. I write UR squared as PU squared minus UR squared. I remove the brackets, which means I end up with OU squared minus UR squared minus PU squared plus UR squared. I cancel out the terms UR squared with a plus and a minus sign in, uh, you know, before them. What I'm left with is OU squared minus PU squared. My U is a point that lies on the circumference of the circle by construction and therefore OU is equal to the radius of the circle little r. So instead of OU, I write little r. OU square is r squared minus, uh, I already have a minus PU squared over there. I have r squared on both left hand side and the right hand side and therefore I cancel them out, which means I'm left with PU squared equal to zero or PU is equal to zero as well. What does it mean for PU to be equal to zero? It means that the points P and U coincide. But then recall by construction that P is a point that lies inside the circle and U is a point that lies on the circumference of the circle. So your PU equal to zero actually means your circle crumbles to a point. That's what it means, right? which means there exists no picture called a circle. This, there is some problem in either the computation or somewhere that has led us to this wrong conclusion because you know for a fact that you use a compass and draw a circle. My question is, where are we going wrong? Let's start with this. I'll tell you where we are going wrong. 
let's take op to be equal to little p you know that little p is smaller than r that's what is given to you you know that op times oq is r squared which means oq should be equal to r squared by p okay now what does p less than r mean p less than r means r minus p is strictly positive r minus p the whole squared is strictly positive i'll expand the square i should have r squared plus p squared minus 2 pr is strictly positive or i'll bring the 2 pr to the other side i'll have r squared plus p squared to be strictly bigger than 2 pr let's divide this inequality by 2p on both sides so what do you have you have half of r squared by p plus p to be bigger than r what do you mean by telling half of r squared plus p plus p is bigger than r what is little p and what is r squared by p recall that your little p is the distance op and your r squared plus p is oq so when you take half of r squared plus p plus p you are actually calculating the distance from o to the middle point of pq so what this means to be bigger than r is that the midpoint of pq should lie outside the circle we took the middle point of pq to lie inside the circle r and we also said are if your r is here then let's kind of uh, have the perpendicular bisector meeting the circle at u and v that entire thing is not possible your r lies outside of the circle which means you don't have a u and v to start with this is exactly where our picture went wrong believe me there was nothing wrong in our computations if everything bare right the computations could still have gone through it is just that the picture was itself wrong that kind of landed us in trouble that made us conclude that the point p and the point u should coincide let's look at another picture triangles i'm pretty sure you would have heard a lot of lot of types of triangles uh you have the right angle triangle wherein one of the angles is uh, 90 degrees you have acute angle triangles where all three angles are necessarily less than 90 degrees you have obtuse angled triangles which means uh, one of the angles in the triangle is bigger than 90 degrees Uh, this is with respect to angles you also have classification of triangles with respect to sides you have equilateral triangle which means all three sides are equal you have isosceles triangles which means two sides of the triangle are equal and when you have all three sides to be unequal what do you call that triangle as scalene triangle <laughs> wonderful that's called a scalene triangle so we all know all kinds of triangles i'm going to take a triangle abc i'm just taking an arbitrary triangle i'm not telling you what kind of triangle i'm taking over here i'll just consider an arbitrary triangle abc uh well from the picture i have drawn it does look like uh, i have made sure to make this a scalene triangle wherein the sides are necessarily not equal all three sides are unequal wonderful now what i do is i draw the angle bisector of angle a and the perpendicular bisector of the side bc and i as I mean, so let the angle bisector of angle A and the perpendicular bisector of BC meet at O. So O is the point where the perpendicular bisector of BC and the angle bisector of angle A meet. 
I drop perpendiculars to my sides AB and AC from the point O. So my angle OQA and my angle ORA are 90 degrees. I have drawn perpendiculars from my point O to these two sides. I join the lines OB and OC. This is my construction again. With this construction, again, you know, I'll not alter the picture. The picture will remain as it is, but I'll remove whatever I have written and then I'll 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 I'll, I'll tell you a few things from here on. So the first thing I want to consider is triangles OPB and OPC. Can someone tell me what one can find between these two triangles, OPB and OPC? So they are congruent. Why are they so congruent? Wonderful. Why are they congruent? Why are they congruent? Please, yes. So by SSS postulate. How do you know SSS here? You do not know anything about the sides OB and OC, right? Sir, SAS. SAS, wonderful. So what, what, are the, what, what are the sides and what is the angle? Sir, OP and BP. B OP is the common side and BP and CP are bisectors so both are uh, equal and angle OPB equal to angle OPC is equal to 90 degree. Wonderful. So what we have is BP and CP are equal because P is the midpoint of the side BC. Angle BPO is equal to angle CPO equal to 90 degrees because this is a perpendicular bisector and you have a common side OP and therefore these two triangles OPB and OPC are congruent triangles. What do you know about congruent triangles? All corresponding sides and angles must be equal. That is what it means for two triangles to be congruent. So if you have these two triangles OPB and OPC to be congruent, I'm going to write down in particular my side OB and OC are equal. Is that fine? Yes, so sir. I have these two yeah. triangles OPB and OPC. Congru I prove first of all that they are congruent triangles using the SAS postulates that yields OB to be equal to OC. Now this is an equation I want to use OB equal to OC. This equation is something that I want to use and so I kind of move this to here and I consider the triangles ORA and OQA. The triangle ORA and the triangle OQA. Can somebody tell me uh, what about these two triangles? They are also congruent. They are also congruent. Why so? AAS. Angle ARAO is equal to angle QAO and AQO is equal to ARO and AO is common. Wonderful. So what is the postulate that you are making use of? AAS. AAS. So AAS. Wonderful. Wonderful. So you're making use of the AAS postulates to say that these two triangles are congruent. We have angle OAR to be equal to angle OAQ because AO is the angle bisector. Angle ORA equal to angle OQA equal to 90 degrees because uh, recall that your OR and OQ are perpendiculars drawn from the point O to these two sides of the triangle. 
and you have OA to be a common side. And therefore, you have triangle ORA to be congruent to triangle OQA. In particular, again, I'm going to write down something. AR is equal to AQ and OR is equal to OQ. The corresponding sides and angles of those two congruent triangles has to be equal. I am interested in these sides. I am going to say AR is equal to AQ. OR is equal to OQ. Again, these two things are important enough for me. So, I will move them to here. And I will consider the triangles. ORB. ORB. And my triangle OQC. These are the two triangles I want to consider now. In these two triangles, I'm going to make use of the Pythagoras theorem. And I have, because I, mean, I know that these are perpendiculars drawn from O to the sides. So angle R is 90 degrees, angle Q is 90 degrees. So my RB can be written as the square root of OB squared minus OR squared. OB being the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle. So my RB can be written as square root of OB squared minus OR squared. But then I know that my OB is the same as OC. This is something that I've already kind of, you know, noted over here. So instead of OB, I write OC. OC squared minus my OR is the same as OQ. And therefore, I'll write this as OC squared minus OQ squared. Now, in my triangle OQC, OC is the hypotenuse and I have a right angle at Q, which means my square root of OC squared minus OQ squared is nothing but QC. So, what do I have? I have RB is the same as QC. Again, this is an important equality for me and therefore I'll write this over here. My RB is equal to QC. Now let's kind of take stock of what we have done. Your AB, one side of the triangle, can be written as being equal to AR plus RB. But then I know that my AR is the same as AQ and RB is the same as QC. So I'll replace AR by AQ and RB by QC. So instead of AR plus RB, I write this as AQ plus QC. AQ plus QC is nothing but AC. So what have I shown? I've shown AB is equal to AC. But then, we started with an arbitrary triangle. We didn't say that, let's have an isosceles triangle, right? We just started with some arbitrary triangle ABC. And again, we have found out something intriguing. We have shown that Two sides of a triangle are always equal. Is that right? Do you agree that they have shown that? Yes, sir. And this time I also took your help because I didn't want to commit any mistake. You guys told me the, the congruent triangles and everything. How did we land up at a place where AB is equal to AC? Now, even for my I, it very clearly tells me that my AB is not equal to AC. My AB is slightly shorter in the triangle. AC is slightly longer in the triangle, ain't it? But I have AB equal to AC. Does somebody want to think about what's wrong? Or... Do you want to hazard a guess as to where we could have gone wrong?
Okay, let's let's observe the picture again sufficiently closely and see if we have made a made something wrong in the picture again, right? The first time we did go, we did commit a mistake in the picture, and so let's do the same thing again. Let's consider. I mean, there are three points in this triangle: A, B, C. Sir. Yes, please. Yeah, I I think your voice is breaking a bit. Oh. Uh, uh, is this better now? I mean. Yes. Yes. This is better. Yeah. And, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, have you not been able to hear me from some 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 time or? No, it was just a bit late, sir. Hello. Yes. Yeah, it was only for this page and uh, the previous okay. one, sir. Okay, one. Uh, and and there, there's a message in the there's a mess there's a message in the chat box. Uh, yes. By Kushi, uh, it's a, I think there is something wrong. There is something wrong where. Uh, yeah, uh, Kushi, if you could elaborate. Okay, so let me uh, continue. Anyway, you have three vertices of this triangle ABC, and you know that any three points are concyclic; they lie on the same circle. So we will consider the circle that passes through the points A, B, and C. BC is a chord in that circle. Because your B and C are points through which the circle passes through, so when you consider the line segment between B, B and C, it's a chord in that circle. Let me draw a section of that circle uh, wherein you know this chord BC is there. Now the perpendicular bisector of the side BC of the triangle or the chord BC of the circle. Divides the arc BC into two equal halves. Let us say that this meets the uh, circle at O prime. So you have two equal arcs, B O prime and C O prime. And you know that equal arcs subtend equal angles. Is that right? Uh, so there's a raised hand. Yes. Uh, by Prakash Kumar. Yes. Yes, please. And he wants to say. Hello, uh, sir. I I do not understand, sir. What are you studying here? I'm sorry. Sir, I I attend a first class in here. You you attend? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you please repeat? Sir, so I, I attend, sir, first class in your. Academic. Okay. So, can you explain why you are studying here? Uh, I work here in ICER as a math faculty, but that is beyond the lecture. Yes. Okay. That's all. Okay, sir. So, equal arcs subtend equal angles. And so, what you have is B angle B A O prime should be the same as angle C A O prime, which means that the angle bisector and the perpendicular bisector, angle bisector of angle A and perpendicular bisector of the side B C, they actually meet outside the triangle. They do not meet inside the triangle. Once again, our picture was wrong. O could not have remained inside the triangle. O should have been outside the triangle. Is that correct? And do you understand what has happened? We took a wrong picture 
not only did we take a wrong picture, we also kind of convinced ourselves to draw perpendiculars from that point O to the sides AB and AC respectively to meet them at Q and R. And this actually kind of caused all this problem of obtaining two sides of an arbitrary tri triangle to be equal. A very tiny mistake, but then that costed us extremely dearly. So when you draw a picture, you always need to convince yourself that the picture you are drawing is not in violation of the other theorems that you would have studied in geometry. For example, in this particular case, we saw that something that we drew inside the triangle was violative of another theorem on the circles. I'll give you one more uh, examples of these pictures, but this time maybe, you know, I'll be extremely careful. Let's discuss squares. So, let's take a square A, B, C, D. We know what a square means. A square means all four sides are equal. All four angles of the square are equal and they are equal to 90 degrees. So let's start with a square A, B, C, D of side length F. Now what I want to do is I want to construct B, E outside the triangle. So my point E lies outside the triangle. But then my length of B, E is also equal to S. Now, because I take my E outside of the triangle and I know angle A, B, C is 90 degrees, that being uh, an angle of the square, I know that my angle A, B, E is an obtuse angle. It's bigger than 90 degrees. Let P be the midpoint of the side A, B. Q be the midpoint of the side DC. Let's join DE and let R be the midpoint of the side DE. Now recall my BE is equal to S, the side length of the square itself. I join DE and I let R to be the midpoint of the side DE. I join QP and I produce it to meet the perpendicular bisector of the of DE at O. Now, we have not been uh, extremely good at placing points, and so when it when 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 we come to that time, I'll discuss. You know, do we want O to be inside the square, on the square, outside the square, etc. But to start with, let's have this. We have the uh, you know we join the line segment QP and we will produce QP to meet the perpendicular bisector of DE at O. I'll join a few more sides here. I'll join OA, OB, OD and OE. So let's recall uh, what all we have. We have a square ABCD of side length S. We construct BE also of the same uh, length as that of the side of the square. But then uh, we will sir? place... Yes, please. Yes, there is a raised hand by Anurag Kumar. Yes, please. Uh, Anurag, if you could uh, unmute and or type it out on the chat box. Uh, 
No, sir. Uh, I think he left the meeting. Sure. Uh, I'll continue. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So we have chosen a point E outside of the square in such a fashion that the length of BE remains the same as the side of the square. Your angle ABE therefore is obtuse. P and Q are the midpoints of the sides AB and DC respectively. I join the side DE. I take R to be the midpoint of the side DE. I join QP and produce it to meet the perpendicular bisector of DE at O. Uh, sir, there is a doubt. Yes, please. There is a doubt in the chat box. Uh, yes. By Sorry, the name reads Pagal Gaming, but uh, if you could unmute or if you could. Yes, please. Can you read the doubt? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I think it's a prank. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. Can I make a uh, small announcement here? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, please don't put unnecessary messages on the chat box. We'll keep the chat box only for questions. Any other comments? Please restrain yourself from doing that and because it disturbs the other participants and the speaker. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, please continue. Sure. Yeah. Finally, I joined the sides OA, OB, OD and OE. Once again, I resort to the same strategy of not erasing the picture, but I'll erase the written part of uh, whatever I have done here, and I will want to discuss a few uh, few things again. You know, I'll I'm mostly concentrating on congruence of triangles, and therefore, if you can help me, uh, once I give you the triangles, then it would be it would be wonderful. So, let's start with these two triangles O R D and O, R, E. So, O, R, D and O, R, E. Can you tell me if these two triangles are congruent? Anybody? Yes, please, ask him to unmute himself and tell me. Anurag, if you could unmute and uh, explain why it is congruent. Continue anyway. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. So he says that two sides are equal and angle are equal. Wonderful. So, two sides are equal and an angle that it contains uh, between these two sides are equal. You have RD to be equal to RE, angle ORD equal to angle ORE. It's a perpendicular bisector. Recall that. So, these angles are equal to 90 degrees. And you have a side OR as a common side to these two triangles. And therefore, these two triangles ORD and ORE are congruent triangles. In particular, I'm going to say the side OD is the same as the side OE. Now, I don't have much of space over here to write this. I'm interested in this equality. 
and so I'll write this within the picture itself. OD is equal to OE, and I'll consider the triangles OPA and OPB. OPA and OPB. These two triangles. I again find out that my P is the midpoint of the side AB, which means PA should be the same as PB. Angle OPA should be the same as angle OPB, which is 90 degrees. And OP is a common side. I make use of the same SAS postulates as earlier to conclude that angle o, triangle OPA should be congruent to triangle OPB. In particular, my OA is equal to OB and Angle OAB is equal to angle OBA. My OA is the same as OB and angle OAB is the same as angle OBA. This is what I have. Again, I'll write these two uh, equations inside here. And finally, I consider the triangles OAD. OAD and triangle O, B, E. These two triangles. And what do I have? No, o, D is equal to O, E. And so maybe I'll, I'll make use of that as well. By constriction, I know that my A, D is equal to B, E is equal to S. So by S, S, S postulates, these two triangles, O, A, D and O, B, E, are congruent. In particular, my angle OAD is the same as angle OBE. So I'll write this again inside here. Angle. I, I, I'm no longer interested in these uh, things between the sides. I've already made use of them over here. And so I'll remove these and I'll write this equation of the angles, angle OAD equal to angle OBE. This is exactly what I have. Now observe that angle ABE, this is an obtuse angle, this is what we said, right? But angle ABE can be written as angle OBE minus angle OBA. My angle OBE minus angle OBA gives me angle ABE. That's what I have. But what is angle OBE equal to? My angle OBE is equal to angle OAD. So OAD. And angle OBA is nothing but angle OAB. OAB. So I have angle OAD minus angle OAB, which is nothing but Angle B A D. B A D. How bad is that? Uh, sir, there is a raised hand by Abhinav yes, Kumar. Please. Yes, please. Abhinav, uh, if you want to type it out on the chat box or if you can unmute and speak. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Hello. Yes, please. Which school is priority? I can, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Which school is priority? Sorry. Uh, this is this is a lecture in mathematics from, and the audience is from eight to twelve standard. Twelfth year. Yes. Uh, no, not exactly 12, but from 8th standard to 12th standard, anyone can attend. Mr. J and V, can I hear? No, people.
people from all the schools can attend this. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Khushi Kumari wanted uh, had a raised hand, or I think wanted to say something. Yes, please. No, sir. Okay. Okay. So we have angle A B E, which is an obtuse angle, to be equal to angle B A D, which is an angle of the square, and the angle of the square is ninety degrees, as you know. But we promised ourselves to kind of look at all possible positions of O, right? Let's do that. Maybe you know that is where we have made a mistake. If O lies on AB itself, so let's say that you know your O lies over here. Then what happens? Angle ABE will be the same as angle OBE. But angle OBE is the same as angle OAD, which means angle OAD. Hello, sir. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Sorry for that, sir. Angle O A D will be the same as angle B A D in this case, which again means that you have said angle A B E, which is an obtuse angle, to be equal to angle B A D, which is a right angle. Now the third possibility for O is. What happens if O lies inside the square? So suppose your O lies somewhere inside the square, then your angle ABE will be nothing but angle OBE plus angle OBA. Once again, this would be equal to angle OAD plus angle OAB. And this would again be equal to angle BAD. And angle BAD, for heaven's sake, is always 90 degrees. It's an angle of the square. Now we have discussed O being outside the square, O being inside the uh, on the square on the uh, side of the square, O being inside the square as well. There is nothing more for us to discuss here. But still, there is something wrong because what we have proved here is that an obtuse angle is equal to 90 degrees. We know by construction that E lies outside of the square, and therefore angle ABE is strictly bigger than 90 degrees, whereas angle BAD is an angle of the square which is equal to 90 degrees. What is the mistake that we have made in this picture? Is what I'll now tell you. See, there are things that we see on the picture, and there are things that we do not see on the picture. Consider this triangle CED. You did not join these things, and therefore it wasn't even visible to you. I am looking at the triangle C. E D. It's a tiny triangle, you know. But nevertheless, the perpendicular bisector of the side C D and the perpendicular bisector of the side D E meet at O. You know the perpendicular bisectors of all three sides of a triangle meet at a point. What is that point called? ortho center wonderful that's called the ortho center so if these two perpendicular bisectors meet at o it means that the perpendicular bisector of ce should also pass through o now let us consider the triangle bce b c e this triangle Now, in this triangle, by construction, BC and BE are equal. They are of the same length, side S. 
which means the perpendicular bisector of ce should pass through b now this is one line that is the perpendicular bisector of ce this is another line that is the perpendicular bisector of ce and we are telling both these both these lines are one and the same right we need to pass the bit aage dheere chalana hai Uh, i have removed this person from the call yes that's much better yes so what this actually means is that if you denote this point as z then the point z b and eventually o all these three points should be collinear points uh, so there is a raised hand by sambhav yes please उन this line oe cannot meet the side bc because your o will be further down here your oe will be something like this is that right so once again we might have discussed all possible positions of o being inside the circle on the i mean inside the square on the square outside the square etc but then we have not done a thorough job of it because o should actually remain outside the square not here but further down the square in such a fashion that the the points e uh, b and o i'm sorry not e uh, z b and o they should be collinear they should lie on the same line so the moral of the story here is when we draw pictures when we kind of make constructions in geometry we have to also make sure that several other things are considered and that we draw the correct pictures for us to end up with correct results a tiny mistake that we might have not observed because hey you know what i am looking at things on a square and therefore why do i care about properties of a triangle or i am looking at things on a triangle and therefore why do i bother about uh, theorems that are valid on a circle i mean these would cost you extremely dearly the picture may look all appealing to you the picture may look absolutely fine to you but you need to make sure that the picture is right in all aspects for you to conclude the right things thank you very much for your patience and i hope you got something out of this lecture uh If there are any questions, then I'll be very happy to take them now. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we can either unmute or uh, use the comment box to type out your questions, and we'll read it.
sir we'll wait for like one minute more and if sure. there are no questions we'll sure sure the questions can be anything under the sun not necessarily from my lecture but even if you want to know something else i'll be happy to uh, share whatever i know with you someone wants to know when Something. will the next class be yes uh, like what was it i didn't, I didn't get that what, what, what was the uh, question when, when will this class again held okay uh, hi anurag this is uh, something which we do every year like once in a year and we have this these lecture series so that audience like you from 8th grade to 12th grade can come and uh, listen to an expert exposition on certain topics so we'll have the other two lectures of biology and uh, physics after the lunch break and uh, we will have a lecture again for you next year uh khushi kumari uh, has a has raised her hand uh, khushi if you can unmute yes please sir if we draw a picture picture how can we uh, prove that this picture is wrong without uh, following any criteria that just you have done that's a very good question thank you very much for that question you need to make sure that you do you do not violate the other properties that you know in geometry when you draw a picture that is exactly what we would conclude on when you kind of reach quite unexpected results that you do not intend to reach that is first of all indicative of a fact that there should be something wrong somewhere and therefore let me check again what all is wrong as we saw in today's uh, you know whatever we had whatever we wrote when we see that there is nothing wrong with the written part of the work when we see that there is nothing wrong in the computations there must be something wrong in the picture that gave us these computations then the question falls back to how do we draw the correct picture that's that's a skill that one should develop out of drawing several pictures to not be violative of the other theorems in other uh, geometrical figures but how do we remember every theorem that we learn in every geometrical figure for us to kind of you know be sure that we are not violative of it this is exactly where you go back to studying the axioms of geometry euclid started with these axioms the five axioms of euclidean geometry are these the first one says between any two points there exists a unique line segment the second one says any line segment can be indefinitely extended along either direction along both directions that's what it means the third one says there exists a unique circle with any given center and any given positive number as its radius the fourth axiom says all right angles are congruent to each other what it means is rather when you measure the angles you are only measuring the angles the side lengths that hold these angles do not matter that's what it says 
The fifth one is an interesting axiom. It says, given a line and a point not on the line, there exists a unique line passing through the given point parallel to the given line. So, these are the only five axioms that Euclid starts off with. It is pretty easy for us to actually find out which of these we have violated in the pictures that we have drawn. So, you don't have to worry about kind of being violative of every theorem that you have learned because that could be many in number and how do you kind of go and verify every, every theorem possible. But axioms are only five in number and therefore you can always remember these five axioms and see which axiom you have violated and if you have violated, then how do you set straight that thing? That is an easy way to do that. I'll probably ask you to, you see, we have three pictures now, right? The three pictures I've also told you are violative of at least one of the axioms that I have stated just now, the five axioms. Uh, you don't have to remember them. You can you know, simply search for the uh, axioms of Euclidean geometry. You will get five in number. You'll get the five axioms. Now tell me, not immediately, you know, later on, whenever you can, the science and, you know, so you can send an email to the Science and Technology Council. Uh, uh, they will have an email address from where you would have received all those uh, uh, communications. Send an email to them telling which axiom we have violated in each of these pictures. Is that, uh, is that, is that, is that an answer that's agreeable to you? While checking if you have violated the five axioms is not a big deal and therefore one can always check that. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Any other questions, please? But that was a wonderful question. Thank you very much for that. Sir, could you share all the pictures with us that you have taught today? The pictures? Yes, sir. Sure, I'll convert this to a PDF file and I'll send it to uh, Sharan and uh, he'll, he'll, he'll post it uh, wherever, I don't know where. Uh, sure. I mean, Sharan, you'll, you, you, you can do that, I suppose, right? Yes, yes, yes. Sure, sir. I'll, 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 I'll share the PDF file with you later. Yes, yes, sure. If there are any other questions, uh, okay, uh, there seem to be no more questions. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for this wonderful talk. And it was, it was even amazing for us to even go through these geometrical constructions, which we have never seen. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, uh, you know, giving this lecture. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye. Sharan, should I, should I leave now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir.